Welcome. My name is William Messicar. I am a master model railroader in the fourth division of the Pacific Northwest region of the National Model Railroad Association. And I want to welcome all of you to the virtual layout tour uh, we'll have presented today by members of the NMRA. Um, we would encourage you to find out uh, about the NMRA and join uh, in order to participate in these virtual tours. We have other virtual clinics and other activities for the National Model Railroad Association that we think you'll find uh, a big help to your modeling and you'll get to meet model railroaders just like you. So welcome to our tour and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, in PowerPoint, a laser pointer, hopefully we can see that and then we'll move the slides along. So uh, the outline of what I'm going to go through tonight is the concept of the layout, uh, which is uh, obviously focused on the, the Cascade Mountains and mainline operation. Talk a bit about trains and routing. I use a, a British style sort of uh, stage where there's a central layout design element and everything is about staging and getting uh, into that element. Uh, go through the construction, uh, access hatches, which uh, I'm using uh, hard shell scenery and every bit of the layout is accessible. Uh, that's turned out to be a really good thing. Uh, I have, um, at the end of the 2020 clinic, I had a list of to-dos. One was to finish this trestle, so I'll walk you through that. Uh, second was to add catenary, and I've added most of the catenary, although not all. Um, show you just a, a few details about how this particular layout um, stays operational and reliably operational. And then last, um, go through some selected photos uh, that were done with this uh, program Helicon Focus, and then finish up with lessons learned. So here's a here's a photo of my three older brothers taken in 1950. That was I was born in 57, and they're working on our father's Southern Railway O scale layout in Memphis, um, where our family uh, was. And so trains have always been in the picture in our our family. Uh, in uh, I wasn't around yet, but it's interesting. I thought that in the foreground there's this uh, Western Fruit Express reefer, so maybe that was foreshadowing tonight. So, and my interest in the Great Northern. So it even looks like perhaps a Great Northern livestock car back here, I'm not sure. I had trains growing up and then moved away from them through college and early career and marriage and so forth and returned to the hobby in 91, uh, largely as a result of checking out the book, Lines West from the Library. And uh, I, the more I read, it's like, I've got to model this. And I was also looking for something that I could, uh, something completely separate from work that I could have set up for five, and I could work on for five minutes or five hours. And so I um, got, got a hold of this Bowser kit and kit bashed it into something that looks sort of like a, uh, a Great Northern uh, 484. And uh, painted it, looks, looks pretty good, but as any of you that have worked with Bowser uh, and they're, you know, they're, pretty long in the tooth by today's standards, but it was a fun project. So then moving on to the design of the concept here uh, and following John Armstrong's Givens and Druthers, and I poured over his documents in planning and, and that was very helpful. Uh, but I also add constraints here. Uh, they were not just Druthers, uh, but some hard constraints. So I was looking for a mountain prototype wanted to focus on mainline train operation. Uh, originally, primarily freight, but uh, I realized eventually that I could do passenger as well. Uh, I wanted some branch line operation. And as I indicated, I was using this term linear design elements, I had one key one that I wanted was yard and engine service. And originally I was thinking this might be Skycomish, but the more I got into it, uh, obviously, Everett and Delta Yard added a lot more operational interest, and so that's that's the the key piece that is included. I wanted kind of not quite, but almost floor to ceiling uh, scenery in areas, a la John Allen, uh, and wanted a mountain segment here. And then the constraints were the room that I had. I had this really awesome long room. It was 35 feet from the door to the wall in one direction, 13 and a half feet across. We've got this little um, 
wood stove pad um, that was uh, a permanent fixture in the room. So that led to, let's see if I, this was the shape, this L-shaped layout was what I came up with. There was also some storage that was other real estate that was required. Sounds like, yeah, we might need to have a couple of folks um, mute their microphone if they would. Thank you. Um, so this is the, the footprint that I ended up with. And then looking at operations, Hill had this analogy that he used um, of the line and the head of his quote rake, which was kind of a revenue rake, and he was a pretty savvy businessman. Um, the head was the tracks from Portland to Vancouver. Um, north and south here. And the handle of the rake was the transcontinental line. And so Everett's right at the, at the head of the rake where the handle joins it. And so this was uh, clearly made some sense to, to use as, as the centerpiece of the layout. And the, and the Everett schematic, as many of you are aware, have this kind of odd arrangement where the line came around the geography here along the waterfront originally and then eventually cut this tunnel through with the Everett station, um, passenger station over here, freight station on the outside of the tunnel on the east. Um, so I actually in a way freelanced this arrangement of track as well as you'll see. Um, and then you've got Delta Y at the north and then uh, Bellingham, Vancouver points north off. So this is the room and the layout. And you see the wood stove with the brick uh, on the floor and the brick is raised above the carpet level. So it is a bit of a tripping hazard. So I was limited of just how much space I could um, put in here. And that in essence set a 24 inch max radius uh, in this helix, Stevens Pass helix, it's in this blob here. So, whoops. Now why is this, there it goes. So um, this shows the track plan. We were just looking at this portion, looking along the room here. Um, it's a track plan as published in uh, Model Railroader this month. Um, you can see this trestle, this is the floor to ceiling area. Then here's Everett, the passenger depot, freight depot, um, that Delta Yard and its in engine service area here. Um, and uh, the main line runs around to Seattle, back, we've got staging underneath. Um, and then there's an upper level that is the mountain segment and it's ex access from helices on both ends. And so this is sort of a folded dog bone arrangement. And then in order to stage trains in and out, there are several places where you've got reversing loops and you can see that on this lower level schematic uh, shown here. And I'm, I think as we go through the presentation, you'll get more familiar with this and one day, uh, when we can have face-to-face -face, uh, meetings, uh, you all are, are uh, welcome for a visit. And then on the bottom is a panorama of one of my favorite trains of fast mail with its dog's breakfast, the different rolling stock. Uh, one, of, one of the trains that I really like uh, to run and one that made the cover of the 2018 um, model railroader. Um, and from a uh, submission to trackside photos. So um, they've gotten a lot of mileage out of uh, that particular photo. So looking back at the room again, this shows uh, sort of the creature comfort, comforts. Um, this is the, you know, we spend a lot of time in our train room, so you need the workbench. So here's my workbench um, and it's on wheels so I can move it wherever I need to get it out of the way. So it's sort of out of the way here. It's where I'm sitting tonight, but you can see uh, the layout itself uh, along the side of the room here. And we'll, in just a couple of slides, we'll kind of walk through it systematically. This just gives you an overall feel. Also shows um, a closed circuit TV um, uh, set up here with four cameras that uh, allow me to keep track of things that are uh, in staging. So back to the concept and, the, and coming up with the track plan, um, I made this drawing in early 1996 um, and it got more complex as, as I went, but I drew uh, my layout to scale and then I built from this and kept it up. You can see I'm an engineer by trade. So we've got six revisions here from the initial uh, Rev Zero. Um, actually is a Rev Seven where I added 
um, a bit of an extension to this um, this staging yard that I call Issaquah Yard because I live in Issaquah. Um, but this track plan I stuck with um, and tweaked a bit, but basically stuck with all the way through. And I think that really helped me keep a, a good standard of construction uh, as, as I went. So then, so many of you may have visited or be familiar with Jack Parker's Northern Pacific layout of uh, Logan, Montana was featured in Great Model Railroads in 1995. And it's when I was designing my layout. Um, and I don't want to uh, give the impression that I'm so clever. I came up with this all on my own. If you look at my layout, the drawing I just showed you flipped over uh, relative to the track plan in Great Model Railroads, you see uh, it's almost a direct copy in many respects. Um, what he had done fit what I wanted to do. I mean, he's just got great vistas of his mountain upper line and then this long area where, you know, he's got a complete North Coast Limited in here straight. And I thought, oh, that just, that is so cool, um, even in a modest space. So that's where the ins inspiration for this design came. So then as we, I walk through a handful of slides here uh, before we get into some of, some of the details. But this shows that sort of um, not quite, but almost floor to ceiling uh, area with the trestle. This um, area right here behind the rock castings is uh, conceals the, the helix. This tunnel is one of the reversing tracks uh, that helps get trains where they need to be. Um, and there's even a prototype in a sense on the on the Great Northern in their early line over Stevens Pass over the twin tunnels. You can see the retaining wall for another crossover back here. Um, so there are two tunnel portals here as there's um, two reversing tracks. And uh, the trees here are all by Canyon Creek Scenics uh, out of Portland. Um, and they just made the layout. They are just fantastic. Um, with the really taller trees in the front, all the way down to toothpick sized trees uh, to force perspective in the in the background. Um, you can see the cat dairy now on the upper level. Uh, if we move a little further, you can see the the uh, cameras on now uh, as the layout is turned on in this photo. Uh, move down to Everett, so uh, the passenger depot. One day I may build a compressed version of the real depot in Everett, uh, but this is my stand-in. Uh, and then the Delta Yard side on a uh, separate track. So these are the sort of the two tracks that are right together, but fit that Everett schematic. Um, a little further down, you see the engine service area. If we click to here, this is a shot of that um, with a six stall uh, roundhouse and turntable. And then Another view over the top from the back of the layout on one of the aisles, uh, looking down on the upper level uh, here where there's double track for a, a lot of this. It's really a passing track. Uh, my goal was to run roughly 30 car trains and that's what I do run uh, here. So uh, that's, that's worked out well. And so moving on to the trains, what trains do I run? Uh, the, the date is set in 1950, and it took a while to get to that. I sort of backdated as I improved my rolling stock and refined it and got more and more accurate rolling stock over the years. Um, but the period between 1947 and 1951 is when the first Streamline Empire Builder ran with the one, uh, one of two versions with no domes. Um, and then the Oriental Limited, which used the pre-war heavyweight Empire Builder cars, ran during the same period. Um, it was converted over to the Western Star in 51. Um, so because of these two trains, I've set things at um, 1950 and roughly spring, say June, this time of year, because of the backdrop painting that you'll see uh, with snow. Uh, got my fast mail that I uh, already indicated, really like to run that, and then um, the Cascadian, uh, which was a much shorter train, heavyweight, ran from Seattle to Spokane. Then the freights, uh, the West Coaster Twin Cities, which was their main freight, Manifest Freight, um, ran often in multiple sections. Yellow. 
it was the uh, West Coaster, if it was headed uh, out to Seattle, the Twin Cities was its name, train 402 going back to um, St. Paul. Uh, Fruit Forwarder, which is a generic name uh, on my layout for any reefer block um, that I want to run. Um, and then uh, blocks of cars from Vancouver uh, down to LA via the Great Northern Western Pacific and Santa Fe, so the inside gateway, uh, it was the GWS um, using the initials going southbound, the SWIG going northbound, and uh, picked up cars as it as it went, but it ran from Vancouver down through Seattle, Portland, and then the inside gateway into California. Locals, um, GNs uh, 717, 718, ran from Seattle to Bellingham, but uh, my layout runs from Delta to Bellingham. Uh, and then uh, various locals up the uh, Skykomish Valley, uh, Darrington Logger, Northern Pacific, um, shared a lot of trackage in Everett. This is another reason to pick Everett versus Skykomish. Um, Northern Pacific oper operated their Auburn to Sumas, uh, Sumas train uh, through Everett um, uh, for some years, uh, not all, but they diverted through Everett often. Uh, and then the Milwaukee had um, locals that ran into Everett from Cedar Falls uh, over to Monroe and then trackage rights on the GN. So those are some of the trains that are run. The way they work on the layout, this shows the routing. Um, so for instance, if we start in staging and bring a train, let's say going from St. Paul to Seattle, comes around and actually goes into a helix here. Um, I've just simplified it and shown that helix moved up here. The chumstick helix runs along that upper level and then down through the cascade helix, cascade tunnel um, into Everett. Uh, it can run either through Delta Yard or straight through um, and then back into staging. Uh, so um, then to reposition or restage the train, that's where these reversing loops are used to um, turn the train and get it ready for the next, next time, you, next run. Then a train running from Seattle to Vancouver, for example, um, comes around from staging, doesn't go up the helix, but comes around from Seattle through the tunnel here at the base of the helix, through Everett, and then uh, follows the same line as if it were going up the Cascade Helix, but instead goes through this um, reversing loop, um, uh, pass through, through Delta Yard, and then through Delta Y back to staging. So um, it's a bit a stretch, but it works. So that's why it's sort of freelanced. I think we all sort of freelance all our layouts. And then a local train routing, I've got, um, in addition to the five train uh, long staging yard here, and you'll see a bit of this in a few minutes, uh, I've got a, a local three track yard that will hold 17 car trains. And so uh, those can be staged and then run again through this tunnel you saw earlier around the end of the helix and then back into Delta. And then they can be turned on Delta Y or you can sneak them around this way if, you, if I want. And I've also got um, a three track staging yard that is Bayside yard that sits right in here. It's not shown on, on this particular graphic, but it is on the, on the track plan that I showed earlier. It's on the track plan that's in Model Railroader. After seeing this, you might wanna go back and uh, sit down with that track plan and maybe spend some more time with it. Um, so now I wanna move through quickly some, how I built this. Uh, so start with the bench work. I started this in 95. You see the uh, Cascade, uh, Stevens Pass Helix here uh, under construction. The Helix, two turns uh, has been built. Uh, and then some of the first uh, bench work. This is where the trestle will be. It's L girder um, bench work, pretty traditional. This looks a little odd, just it's in two levels here to accommodate the, uh, the trestle. And you, I've used paper mock-up, I use that a lot as I was going through this just to get a sense of the massing. You know, what does it look like? Uh, here I had some of the uh, pieces of the microengineering kit that I used to kind of check dimensions. You can already see I'm wanting more than what this little straight piece of the 
fascia now would allow. And eventually I cut this out, um, dipped it down with a little plywood gusset, and that's what you see uh, in the layout today. So, you know, making changes on the fly certainly work. And then I'll draw your attention to, I've got this little um, um, kind of site plan here that shows where you're looking on the, on the, fo on the uh, layout uh, in terms of where the photo is looking um, on this key plan. So I got the first base of the, of the, of the track work of the, of the track plan built uh, without the upper level realized that um, I was way too short. Uh, the layout was much too short. Um, somebody, it looks like Larry might want to mute his microphone. Oh, sorry. thought it was auto mute. Yep, thank you. No worries. Um, so I decided to raise it 12 inches and kind of mold it around and decided, well, I'll put some uh, eye hooks in the ceiling joist, use some of this climbing hardware and some all threads and and put some two by fours under and and see if I can lift this thing up. And I did, it worked very smoothly. I just crawled around under, under the layout, uh, doing a few turns on these all threads uh, as I went. And I literally, it took a couple days to do it. Um, I literally could have run trains the whole time I lifted this. Um, and then I replaced the legs uh, after I got the layout where I wanted. You can see kind of the embryonic control panel there um, without any, any markings on it. Uh, this, this slide shows, or this photo shows the upper level added. And these are where hatches will go for access. And then you see at this point, it's a four track staging yard. I added a fifth track later after I had all the all the hard shell built um, through these hatches. But um, this just gives you an idea of how things run. And my my steamers um, really are, they're confined to the lower level. They cannot pull much of anything up the helices. Um, so they're, they're confined to run on the lower level. So they spend time just on, this is all one level. Um, to get to the upper level, I need multi-unit, um, like um, four-unit uh, Stewart's, for example, I run, or um, Atlas Genesis, or multiple units in terms of like Y1s, the electrics. Um, that's how, how I operate onto the upper, upper level. Whoops. There we go. This shows the hard shell. It's just aluminum screen wire. Um, staple to uh, wood kind of frame. Uh, these are two lift out hatches here and they're just hot glued together and they've worked really well. There's not a straight piece in them. Um, and I cover this with plaster cloth and then uh, soupy plaster over the top of that. See some of that down at the end of the layout right here. Uh, works pretty well. I've not had any problem with radio control with the, um, with the screen wire producing any problems. Um, you know, in terms of electrical problems. Painting the backdrop, um, did a hike up a benchmark mountain, which is a little north of Skykomish up the uh, Index Galena Road, which of course is closed right now, but hopefully one day will be reopened. This is uh, looking southwest, this is Spire Mountain. And, uh, you know, it was a great candidate. So decided to put that on the layout. You can see kind of how I'm stepping through that process and then the finished product here. It's just acrylic paints and just took my time, started with the white and worked to more detail. The rock work and ground cover. Uh, rock work is on a lot of the layout. The early parts you saw um, plaster castings, woodland scenics, moles, pretty straightforward stuff. But then I discovered cripple bushes, um, rubber rocks. And so this shows some of the rubber rocks. Um, which this is the way they come, um, or at least they did at this time, 2004, um, already weathered. They look great. They put them up with hot glue, maybe, you know, this pink styrofoam board to take up, you know, space to get things like you want it, but just hot glue these in place and then work plaster around and, and paint. Um, and then I've got a lot of scree slopes, something that a lot of people seem to omit, but I think makes mountain scenes look very realistic. 
Um, this is kind of a frangible rock that I found here near where we live uh, in Issaquah and Tiger Mountain. Um, this stuff is great because you can break it into smaller pieces if you need um, and just mount it in uh, matte medium and does a great job for holding the rock. So I've got a, a lot of scree slopes made out of that stuff. Um, painted the track, at, you know, after it was all uh, constructed. Um, pretty standard stuff, I guess. Um, call your attention to one great use of cleaners bags. Um, bags from the cleaners are so light, you can put them over anything and they don't damage uh, any of your, you know, if you're careful, uh, your scenery. And then here's, uh, again, the hatches uh, been removed here for access for painting. The underworld, I'll call it where the staging is, maybe interested in. This is a um, five track uh, staging yard um, that's under most of the length of the layout, a whole 30 car trains. And then uh, you see the same uh, staging area from the other direction. Here's one of the um, closed circuit TV cameras. And you see another one uh, looking the other direction. So you can always see what where trains are. Um, and can tell where to stop them is the important part and whether they're moving or headed toward the floor, um, which knock on wood has not happened. Um, and then this is um, in the distance here is the, one of the three track staging yards. This is the one that I extended will hold 17 car trains. And it has, a, I'll show on the next slide, a cassette that slides here um, to, because this is a hatch area. So in order to open the hatch, I need to pull the trains out, slide this cassette back, and then I can open the hatch. So, let's see. Huh, there we go. Uh, this shows the um, same area a little bit further back from the five car, our five track staging yard. Um, this is where after I built the hard shell, I realized, wow, there's a ton of space under here. I could put this other yard in. And so that was one of the additions I made, one of my revisions. Um, you can see where I kind of went through and cut out my supports for the upper level track work. Um, you know, one by fours were a little overkill. So this has worked just fine. Um, and the trains just kind of wind their way through. That cassette is off in the distance here. This is what it looks like from above. Um, you can see the uh, the joint, the, tr the original yard ended here, uh, added the cassette. I've got, um, you know, four more feet here. And to get into the access from the hatch, the hatch has been removed here, by the way. I just have to slide this out of the way with no trains on it. Um, to line the track up, I have this um, plywood gusset here that's attached to the, to the sliding cassette itself. And then the centering, um, nubs here that uh, it's pretty tight fit. So when you bring this in and then push these bolts through and tighten them up by hand, uh, the tracks line up. So that's the way I keep that uh, operational. Uh, this shows one of the um, helices, uh, the chumstick helix, and it's uh, a 24 inch radius. So it's a 2.7% grade, 4% compensated for curvature. So it's it's pretty steep. And it's why you need multiple units to pull trains uh, up the helix. Uh, and both of the helices have this clear space in the middle that you can uh, access the helix. Because if there's one place that uh, I can have derailments, it's here as cars kind of bump and bump into each other. Um, going down mainly uh, can push a truck off the track and, and uh, hear that telltale sign and go fix that. Um, and then I've uh, used plexiglass here as guards and it stiffens the plywood. Um, and these are, uh, the L brackets are angled uh, to be at right angle to the track, not parallel to the vertical here. Otherwise you end up with a little bend in your plywood, which you don't want. Um, and then going into the helix, I learned this on the, the first helix because I was a bit sloppy uh, with transition from level track, which would be say this curve right here to the helix track. Um, so on this one, I uh, cut a piece 
of plywood that made a kind of a curved Y shape. Um, this leg of the Y is flat. This leg of the Y starts the ascent into the match the grade of the helix. And you can see right here where there's a little shim, a little bit more space. Um, so this makes a smooth transition and that makes the track work work really well, operate well. And I had to go back and retrofit the original helix to, um, to make that same adjustment. Uh, I've mentioned already a bunch of times access, and uh, in my mind, access is something that's key. And it's something that uh, Jack Parker pointed out in his layout, uh, and I kind of use the same concept. Uh, all these orange spots are access hatches. You've got the centers of the two helices that are accessible by ducking under. This aisle back here, uh, which you see, see me standing in this, um, where I can reach in and do whatever I need. In fact, I built the three track staging yard with all the hard shell already in place. Uh, but, you know, re-railing something or moving something around, all easily done. Um, this is me standing in one of the hatches that's been dropped down, uh, I've taken a photograph here. Uh, but it provides, you can see in the distance here, this is access to the five stage yard uh, as well as the upper yard. And you saw I painted the backdrop from the hatches. So um, they're really handy. And then the simplest access of all is this aisle um, that runs around the back side. No duck under required there. Um, from below, this is what the hatches look like. There are two hatches here. Uh, I see the hinge uh, along this line. There's a pin, which is just a bolt that's had its threads cut off, so it's just a drift pin. Um, there's another one over here. You pull those out, the hatch swings down, um, then hook it to a piece of chain, and, uh, and it stays put. And you can then get to either um, staging or this is the bottom side of the upper level. This particular hatch is where the cassette now runs across. So it's a little more complex now than it used to be, but um, still still works. Uh, the aisle I just mentioned, this is shows a, a shot down the aisle. You can see the uh, closed circuit TV camera. You can see the, off in the distance is the curved throat um, to the five stage yard. This is chumstick helix and then you see Delta Y here in the foreground. I've debated if there's enough space in here, maybe I ought to scenic this uh, would be uh, look really cool. The other thing I'll point out is the backdrop is about almost two feet away from the layout itself and from the room, uh, you can't tell. So by the way, this is, uh, I didn't mention it before, this is Glacier Peak, uh, which from some of the higher peaks around Skycomish, you can see Glacier. Um, I don't think there's anywhere on the on the rail itself that you can see glacier, but from some of the higher peaks you can. Um, the Alpine Gulch trestle construction. This is uh, interesting, I think. I find this interesting. It's originally uh, built of wood uh, as a temporary trestle, uh, which is normal um, road bed down. Um, excuse me a minute. Get a sip of water. And this um, trestle was in continuous operation. Um, it was um, wood. Then as I built the towers, and I built them after I built the landscape. So the towers are built to the ground line, and they're built from the top down in essence. Um, you see one of the towers off here with a little jig that um, bolts up under the uh, wood. And that holds the trestle where I can then mark the ground of where I cut a hole. So the support for the trestle will then, well, the tower then uh, goes through the hard shell down below. And the way I built this was I would build a, a girder tower pair. Um, once I had that ready, I would um, make a cut, remove the wood, um, put this in. And so that I was out of operation for, you know, just a few hours here, really, um, maybe a day. And then uh, as I made the next uh, long span and then piece of uh, tower, 
to do the same thing. You can see one of the intermediate pieces here in the distance. So it shows how the towers um, are built. They're kit bashed. They're just the typical microengineering top three um, panels. And then the bottom is all custom fabricated, all with diagonal bracing. Um, I'm a structural engineer, so if something like this, you gotta have triangles everywhere. Um, don't want any flexible pieces. Um, and then the plinths uh, and the bearing hardware um, all built. Uh, and these are just wood and then you file them down to give that tapered shape. And then this is this base just shown here is actually um, attached to the L girder. And then there is an oversized hole with a um, uh, fender washer that allows horizontal movement uh, of maybe a half an inch in each direction. And then the thumb screws here on the all thread allow me to uh, position the tower right beneath the rail where it needs to be at the top. Um, so, that, so I can make minor adjustments to get this um, just like it should be um, as I bring this tower online. And this is the bridge, uh, the trestle is substantially complete. I've already uh, got all the substructure in. Uh, these have been um, uh, plastered up again. You can see one pony bent down here that's um, not longitudinally braced, just uh, transversely braced. Um, the abutment with uh, its uh, just kind of rework the plaster, the hard shell here. Still got scenery to go. Uh, the deck has not been ballasted at this point. Uh, it ultimately is a ballasted deck. And this shows the final uh, configuration with the trees back in, uh, the ground line, scree, um, the different base locations for the tower, which I think adds a lot of interest. And uh, you can't really see Alpine Creek trestle too much uh, or the bridge there. So this is a bit freelance from the actual line. And again, these trees by Canyon Creek, you can see uh, Douglas fir with the limbs missing partway up, which you see a you know, burned tree here was struck by lightning, multiple trunk trees. Uh, uh, Pete and Barb Vassler do a great job there. Uh, of trees, so uh, kudos to them, and they really made my layout come to life uh, as a Northwest layout. The stream here is just painted. There's uh, right now is just uh, painted dark, uh, put some gloss over it, and then some white highlights to look like running water, and it it's pretty simple and it works. The catenary. So. This is a, an example of Great Northern's catenary from the Westinghouse's publication about the electrification that was written in 1929. You see they've got this very uh, characteristic um, two circuit arrangement at the top of um, their poles. And so I was trying to kit bash these or you know scratch build them really. And a friend of mine, Mike Dubinsky said, hey, let's try to, uh, let's try to 3D print those. So he, um, I found him a, an insulator, sent him a drawing. Uh, he produced it on, uh, on uh, Google SketchUp. And from there, with some scaled dimensions from photos of Skykomish, we came up with the dimensions of the, of the uh, pole. He built a, a SketchUp model of that, sent it to Shapeways, and this is the final result that came out. This is what comes back from Shapeways. And I just drill a hole in the bottom uh, to put a brass stud that can then be um, stuck into a hole on the uh, on the layout. Uh, paint these. Uh, if there's a single track application, you've got this diagonal, uh, the arm and diagonal brace. And so that's just um, kit bashed with some uh, Tai Chi uh, insulators here, which I think work pretty well. And then if it's uh, dual track, then uh, I take one of these poles and take the insulators off or the cross arms and just have um, the the two circuits and the lower circuit on one side. So let's look at that. Uh, this shows an application now um, 
with the Oriental Limited running, the bunch of head-end traffic and a heater car. Um, you can see the um, single track, these first two um, applications, and then dual track is, as the uh, passing track comes online. And I don't model the catenary itself, just the poles. You almost, unless you're looking against the sky in photos, you almost can't see the wire. Um, that was just too much uh, for me. So I had to uh, pull, play the good enough card somewhere along the line. Um, and then 1950 is kind of handy because it was about in that range where they were repainting these Y1s into the Empire Builder colors. Um, and so I surmise there, although I've not seen photos of the mixed consists, but there must have been at least at some point. This is a Tenshoto uh, Y1. And these guys are bulldogs. They've, they've got so much weight, they can pull anything. Uh, so great uh, little, uh, and both of these are brass. In fact, all, all of this train is brass that you see, including the Challenger consist back here. Um, that's my catenary. This is a double track um, operation, that same train a little further back. I'm just I'm working around the room here. Um, with the two track application. And here you would have, um, you know, a, a little wire support and then two strings of catenary messenger uh, wire that runs along uh, up parallel to the track. But I include these insulators and then you would normally, you know, barely see the, the wire that goes between these two. One thing I, um, I anticipated and caught um, is in my helix, there's limited headroom. So you can see without doing a little um, work here, um, even with the pantograph held down a bit with this uh, little brass um, rod here, the pantographs won't fit under. Um, this is where the vertical curve for coming out of the helix happens on the outside of the visible part of the layout. So um, I just took a Dremel, um, cut back some of the aluminum wire and cut back some of the wood. Now this works. I just have to make sure that, uh, you know, this setup is, is always there or I'll rip the pantograph off a nice brass locomotive, which I don't want to do. A um, few uh, details of uh, wiring. This is the control panel. Uh, it's just made out of um, some quarter-inch plywood, nice plywood, birch plywood, uh, painted white, then overlaying with uh, uh, pinstriping tape and then paint black. Uh, worked pretty well and uses Zipatone lettering. Uh, it was pretty simple. Uh, it folds down, so I've got all the um, uh, blocks and turnouts. All the turnouts are powered. I originally wired the layout and ran it for years under cab control and then shifted to DCC in 2003. Had this set up where I thought I could switch back and forth between DC and manual, DCC and manual, and when I saw how well the locomotives ran on DCC, uh, I switched it over and never went back. It's never been turned back from the first day. I just blasted through all my locomotives, putting decoders in. Um, this shows um, a bit of the, uh, the tortoise controls underneath and the wiring bundles. I really don't like spaghetti bowls of loose wire, so I have them all bundled up, um, maybe a little anal. And then this is a useful trick with tortoise machine if you're doing uh, hard shell or this kind of bench work. Uh, occasionally, going to have a tortoise. Uh, switch points are going to be right over an L girder, or maybe they're right over a joist and over an L girder. So um, what I came up with was um, take a little piece of aluminum tube, hot glue it to a bigger piece of plywood, and then have uh, a brass L-shaped piece. This goes up to the to the switch points. Um, this comes back, solders to this flat plate, and it has a hole. And so um, a remote control for um, this switch point with the tortoise off to the side. And then with or without this kind of setup, a cool thing to do with tortoises, because I hate this setup, is take fender washers 
um, oversized hole, and now you can make the adjustment to get the tortoise to work without shorting. Uh, I power, you know, the points, uh, and they switch with the tortoise, uh, but if you don't get the tortoise position right, it'll short. Um, and this works great. And if you use the fender washer with just a um, tortoise machine by itself, um, I just take a file and file off a flat edge here, uh, and that flat edge can go right up here, and then the screw goes in. You have just enough movement to align this thing. Works like a charm. And then this is just an extreme example where I've got that same aluminum tube and a, a little stiffened uh, double L bracket that goes up to the switch points. And I had, I, you know, I, I was, I laid my track and then I, I, as I went through, I was like, damn, 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 everyone, they're over the L girder, the switch points are over the joist. I mean, it's like I've hit everyone, it seems like. So I built a lot of these. Uh, running with super elevation, which all the curves have, running brass cars without derailing requires, um, they come with springs on both ends. The springs are quite stiff. I take the spring off of one end, replace it with a, just a white piece of tubing uh, and no spring. So this is, the truck's completely free to rotate, just cor corrects all the problems. You don't even really need this um, little piece of styrene, except for when you pick the car up, the truck will drop about a half an inch. Um, if that doesn't bother you, you don't need the styrene, but it's easy to slap that on. Um, standards, uh, I run a lot of brass on, on my layout and the wheels have to be engaged. Um, and if they're not, uh, I will short. I don't have DCC friendly turnouts. And so if, you know, if this, this rail, if the wheel on this rail touches this rail, uh, it will short. Well, what I found was virtually, I, I, I think it is every brass car that I have looked at, the wheels are too tightly gauged. The gauge is too narrow. Um, and my theory is, is that the importers, um, they give you a wheel set that's, um, the wheels are too close together, it'll always fit on a piece of track. If it was the other way around, it wouldn't fit and people would return the cars. Um, but I regage uh, every piece of brass. And then to run brass passenger cars with 24 inch uh, minimum radii, which is most people would say is lunacy, uh, and it probably is, but I don't care. Um, I carve the uh, center sills uh, back and the coupler pockets back on these cars. And you can't tell from the side. <clears throat> you can't see this at all. Um, so the car looks the same. And then you'll notice axles and backs of the wheels are painted so that when you take photographs, you don't see nice shiny little blobs under the cars. And so that's kind of how I, how I built all this, uh, how I operate it. And now I'll go through a group of selected photos and, and let's look at some of the trains. So here's a before electrification, a rare eastbound local uh, with a steamer. Uh, it did not pull this train up the helix. I positioned this um, just for uh, a photograph. But I like this photo because it shows a lot of these rubber rocks, the cripple bush rocks and the cliffs. The rock work turned out really nicely in this area. There's um, Glacier Peak off in the distance. And uh, then behind the caboose here is a tree that um, Canyon Creek made for me from a photograph of an actual tree. I've got uh, a number of, of trees that they've custom built for me. Then off in the distance, some of these are K and S trees. They're not in business anymore. And then um, Canyon Creek's uh, Scenix makes these toothpick trees or you can make them yourself. They're pretty simple. Uh, big trees in the foreground, tiny trees in the background. This is the rear end of a uh, fruit forwarder headed to Seattle and point south um, with the uh, catenary in place. I like my uh, reefers um, with uh, some, you know, at this point being um, having silver roofs repainted to make them a little more efficient thermally. Got a mix of steel and wood side reefers. Uh, here's eastbound uh, train 402 Twin Cities. Uh, with a three 
Y1 lash up, one still green, two in the new Empire Builder colors. You can see the, the catenary again, the poles, I think work pretty well. And then this is the area where there's a gap between this point and the backdrop. And we're looking almost into the corner of the room. The backdrop is coved around the corner, so you don't see the corner. And the rubber rocks uh, over here scree in the foreground. This is uh, train 401, the West Coast or westbound. Uh, a little bit further, I'm just working down, if you're watching the um, key plan, I'm just kind of working along on the upper level and then we'll come back and work along on the lower level. So um, train through here, which um, in this case, uh, pretty much all my rolling stock is accurate for 1950. Um, there's, there may be some violations here and there, but in general, um, you don't see uh, cars that are in the red or the slant serif, that sort of thing. Uh, those came later. The same train, different angle, sort of a panorama. Uh, so uh, again, looking back, this is that gap area behind the layout. And then the gap here is only maybe an inch. Uh, and that, that little inch makes a difference. It actually helps, I think. This is eastbound, um, and this is a uh, contrived photo, if you will, um, 1947 Empire Builder. The first runs westbound and eastbound, um, and they, they ran these E7s for a while, uh, but the first runs, they um, carried the E's across um, Stevens Pass, and so uh, put an electric motor on and pulled the whole train over. And very, really quickly they got to the point and maybe within days of just having the electrics pull uh, the train. And uh, I guess they had to get uh, other E7s positioned on the other side. Um, but most of the photos you see are of electrics pulling the consist without the locomotives. And let me say that um, you've probably already put this together in your mind. Uh, I've got this W1 here, which is an enormous locomotive. Uh, there's no way it'll run on the 24 inch radii. Uh, even the broad curves here on the uh, end, which are approaching 60 uh, inch radius, this thing won't run on. Um, and these were, I think it's interesting to note, they were part of the reason that uh, GN uh, got rid of the electrification. These two locomotives were hard as they could be on the track work for the same reason. Long wheelbase, they pushed the track all over the place. Um, so they were, they were strong, they were cool looking, but they were um, a little bit of a pain in the butt. Here's uh, another shot, uh, eastbound Cascadian waiting in the hole here, four unit heavyweight Cascadian. Um, W1 pulling the reefer block uh, along and, and uh, the way GN operated was uh, they kept these freights rolling and they would put uh, certainly this kind of passenger, maybe all passengers in the hole while, um, while they uh, freight passed them. There are certainly photos of, of that. Uh, here's the eastbound Oriental Limited, uh, that same train we saw earlier. You see a little bit more of the train. See how the, the backdrop kind of works with the, uh, with the hard shell. Here are the rubber rocks. This is another custom tree that um, uh, Canyon Creek's Scenics did for me of a snag. So works pretty well. And you can kind of see this little gap right there that breaks things up nicely. A uh, different shot of that same 1947 Empire Builder fresh, first run gives you just a little bit longer shot along the top of the layout. See how things look there. Um, whoops, kind of a little quick. I'll give you just a few more seconds to look. There's the snag again. Um, this is shot with Helicon. So uh, these would be maybe 10 photos here that I assemble in the computer so you can get something very close to the camera in focus all the way back to the tunnel portal here. 
Here's a stage photo of the first run of the 1929 Empire Builder through the Stevens Pass Tunnel. There's a photo that Lee Pickett took, one Y1, a heater car, RPO. Um, this is the portal for the first tunnel, not the eight mile tunnel, but hey, it works. And then the electrification uh, kind of works here as well. You might have seen a version of this in the Great Northern Historical Society. Uh, modelers pages where we uh, actually it was the the goat uh, where we uh, kind of kit bash this whole photo scene because Great Northern had moved a photo of uh, index Mount Index um, to be adjacent to Stevens Pass uh, in 1929 so sort of fake news from 1929 they didn't have Photoshop but they had the same idea. Now from the lower level, this is uh, train 402 coming from Seattle, taking a train up to Skykomish or in my case Everett uh, to be handed off to the to the electrics. Uh, they ran these R2s, these big articulated uh, on that, that piece of the line. Darrington Logger, a North, Northern Pacific uh, train going past Delta Y here and you can, uh, they actually ran these as less than car load um, express car you'd see in, in trains, in the MP trains from time to time. It's a different shot. One of the activities I had in 2014 was to complete the engine service area. Well, I've done that now too, so it's, it's another bit of update. There's the engine service area again uh, with some uh, FTs. Uh, I think these were uh, uh, painted by Ray Wheeler. I thought I saw a Ray join here after I started. Uh, he's painted several of the locomotives that I run on this and done a great job. Um, these are his his FTs, uh, bringing the GWS through Delta Y from Vancouver. And then uh, this staged uh, photo, which uh, the Great Northern actually had a version of this with the W1 and FTs and an R2 uh, at Skykomish with steam, diesel, and electric. And uh, I think Craig Thorpe uh, painted a, a version of that that's on the cover of the second edition of Lines West. So, um, and if you want to ever wondered uh, during World War II, um, you could have electric diesel and steam all in one train going over Stevens Pass. So they actually ran them together uh, for a short bit. I love these orange sided uh, plywood side cars uh, that GN had in this era. Uh, these are intermountain cars. Uh, they really pop just in color. But this is another one of the these um, actual custom uh, created trees from uh, Canyon Creek Scenics. And then you see the, the scree again in the background, all the complexity um, that you can build uh, with mountain scenery. So uh, I really like this photo. And then little details like reway marks, uh, repack, stencils, that sort of thing on, on the cars. This is the reason I need to um, get my catenary down into Everett on my layout um, so I can run these electrics across my trestle. And they did run trios of these Y ones. You see photos of, of these guys. Um, and I'm, I'll get there one day. So that's on my to-do list. This is another shot um, looking down on the trestle and you see the ballasted deck uh, here. I don't think GN had, um, this is more of a Milwaukee thing, but I just like the look of it and uh, it was, it, it worked well. And then a final shot here. Uh, this is the R2 again um, with uh, photoshopped um, exhaust and it's on a uh, just over, maybe it's a 26, 27 inch radius curve just outside the Stevens Pass Helix. Um, and if you get the right angle, it's not too bad. Um, you would think, oh, putting a, uh, a locomotive like this on a 24 inch radius curve is just sacrilege, but it, it works from the right angle. Um, and the 
we started this presentation, I showed you the wood stove. The wood stove's right behind this area. And so I've got a piece of masonite that's painted blue that I put up to do a photo like this. Uh, again, helicon with the near field in focus all the way around the back of the curve in focus. So lessons learned. Um, and what's next? One, I, if I had this to do over again, if I could do it, I certainly would have broader curves. I've spent hours fiddling around with things to make these what were used to be called um, sort of conventional curves, uh, which are tiny radiuses by today's standards. I would, I would make those bigger if I could. Uh, following standards, uh, totally improves the operation. I followed as much as I could. When I didn't, I got bitten and had to go back and do rework. So uh, the standards that, that we all have as a, as a group now in MRA um, maintains are really helpful. And just jump in and try things. I think a lot of people, I certainly was like this, I'm not sure about this, but then I would start working on it and it just, flew together and you know now I was generally only a couple of times did I rework things I was general genu generally pleased with the way things turned out so you know it's the zen of the journey right and then what's next uh, further development of operations um, yeah, operations where I'm using um, wheel reports and switch lists and uh, it's a little tedious right now but I think I can refine those and make it a little more interesting uh, I want to add signaling, want to bring the catenary into Everett, and then maybe expand the layout down the other wall uh, with some real estate acquisition. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, that's, that's what's next. So with that, um, I'll stop talking. I've been going here about an hour. So I appreciate you hanging with me and I'll take any questions you have. And again, remind you, if you want to watch some video, you can go to Model Railroaders website and... Uh, search either my name or Great Northern and generally it'll, they'll come up. Thank you very much, Lee. That was an, out, an outstanding clinic. Uh, really enjoyable and we found out a lot about your layout. And we'll see everybody uh, here next month on the 16th. Hello again. Um, this is a, another reminder that this uh, virtual layout tour has been brought to you by members of the 4th Division of the Pacific Northwest region of the National Model Railroad Association. And we hope you've enjoyed it. And we want to encourage you to again, find out about the NMRA online. Uh, both PNR and NMRA have an excellent website where you can get information about joining and participating in this and other activities like our, our uh, uh, clinics that are held all over the region. So thank you for joining us today and great wish you great modeling.